Uh, welcome everybody. Kia ora tato. Um, ko manga tua te manga, ko tairi te awa, ko nati wikitoria te iwi, ko Rawari Stevens Aho. I live in the shadow of a mountain called Mangatua on the banks of the Tairu River. I'm fifth generation Kiwi that came over uh, from the descendants of Queen Victoria. And my name is David Stevens. And I thank you all for being here this morning. What um, I wish to talk to you a little bit about is um, looking at uh, some of the future opportunities that might be um, available when we're integrating digital technologies. We've been um, studying digital technologies for a little while here at AgriSearch, and um, one of the things that has come to mind is that if we are looking at particularly making real change in our grass and productivity and our sustainability into the future, it's about integrating those technologies. So just like to thank all of my co-authors on this. We've all been working in this space in some way, shape or form, everything from um, animal behavior through to uh, nutrient leakage, all the way through to um, data handling and uncertainty. I'd also like to um, thank uh, some of the people that were working alongside PAMU, which is New Zealand's um, state-owned enterprise, which manages about 170 odd farms around the country. Um, and Edison, who we have worked with in the virtual um, herding space. Now, this is might be a view that you think of when you think of technology these days. And so you see the farmer out there, he's got some of the latest technology in terms of um, the pasture that's there, that's plantain. He's measuring it with his plate meter. He's got his computer out on the bonnet of the um, truck. And I'll explain to you later why this is relatively ineffective. But where is the potential of digital technologies? And quite often what we think about is the fact that um, it's about automated collection of data. It's about storage and interpretation of data, which is usually um, a relatively instantaneous sort of uh, an approach. It's about longitudinal. Uh, information transfer, it means that you can store stuff and pass it on from generation to generation. Hopefully we get some new insights through things like machine learning. And then we assist in decision making, which means our decisions are better than we might have made without all of that information. Um, really, it's about taking data from one place when you start to integrate it and inform and understand actions and other tasks and then using some of those predetermined data parameters to control implementation in other places. So um, if we want to control water quality, for example, then maybe we have that, uh, those uh, parameters set in and we then uh, alter our grazing management. So what do you do with di digital technologies? Well, pretty much the way we're thinking about it is you break it down into three spaces. One is you can characterize what you've got. And so soil and pasture resources, for example, both tend to use things like image analysis, um, radar technologies, um, uh, LIDAR. And so the opportunity there is to characterize those and they are basically their static resources most of the time. Um, and so those sort of technologies work quite well. When you work with, work with animals, then you are starting to use things like GPS, you're starting to use accelerometers and um, understanding the animals, temperature sensors, things like that. The next thing you can do is to predict. Predict what's going to happen when you put fertilizer onto a soil. Um, now, once we have things like hyperspectral analysis of soils where we can uh, know what nutrients are available, then we can start to manipulate that. But we also then start to look at the uh, forage response to grazing, the forager's response to the climatic inputs, the diseases and pests and their response to climatic input, uh, 
inputs. And what you see here is a list of binary options. Uh, the problem with farming is that they all happen at once. It's actually a complex set of interactions that we are trying to predict at any one time. So the pests and the diseases might uh, accelerate, but then they influence the animal, which then changes its grazing pattern. And so what we're trying to do, and this is what a farmer does all the time, is to try and um, understand what's happening in that space. And to get digital technologies into that space, there is a lot of background information you need to know. And then the last thing that you want to do is try and control the animal or control the situation that you have. So you're directing the animal in the landscape so that you provide accurate decision-making. You might be able to automate decisions. And in the case of the halter um, collar, which you see in the photo there, the farmers, the, some of the beta testing farmers tell you that um, to automate the decision to bring the cows in in the morning gives them an extra half hour lion. Interesting thought that that's one of the um, novelties of their day. And then you can pass information along the supply chain. So that starts to impact on the, um, the Elys of this world and the Fonterras as, as you understand where your product came from, what it was made of and where it goes in the future. So the first thing that we can see is integrating sensors and the integrating sensors um, is an opportunity to start to understand in this instance, the animal, where it goes, what it does. Uh, in this particular instance, you see an animal wearing a, um, a urine sensor on the back of the animal. It can be related to the GPS unit on the front of the animal. If it's got it, it possibly has uh, something strapped to its ankle these days. Um, and then you can start to predict uh, where it urinates, what loading that is on the soil, what sort of uh, environmental impact that might have into the future. And so all of those things give you some power in changing what we do in our grasslands. But really the power comes when we start digitizing our landscape. And so we have examples uh, where we have used um, high resolution mapping and GIS to um, define aspects and link that with uh, weather, soil moisture, and start to target extremely um, specific parts of the landscape for things like um, legume introduction or weed control, where you really start to um, micromanage your environment. Uh, and that uh, gives you the opportunity in the future to, to have things like species-specific landscape implementation. Um, linking uh, digital twin farms where you actually have that farm represented in its digital form uh, that you can then manage. So some of those opportunities are quite significant. And I want to talk a little bit about the limitations and the challenges because I think unless we address these, then we are not going to make that much progress. And in the black at the top is sort of the usual list of suspects when we start talking about digital technologies. We're talking about calibration of a tool, you know, the changing spectral conditions when you're using photographs, the range limits, you know, whether or not you've got um, access to satellites or to um, a cell phone network or all those sort of things. Robustness of the technology. We saw the farmer with his laptop on the bonnet of the ute. That's not going to go very far. Um, that's all standard stuff. What we're really interested in are some of the more intractable things. And again, complex adaptive systems are generated by the interaction between the biophysical and people. So data quality and certainty is really, really important. If you can't get good data and know that it represents what you're trying to uh, measure, then how can a farmer trust that? And then handling and interpretation, again, the question is the same. 
Uh, are you a trusted person in terms of handling that data? And are you providing appropriate interpretations with the data and what it might mean, especially if you are working in the space of um, creating action from that data? Um, and then comes the integration of data sources. And that is uh, a decided challenge in this day and age when there are so many people stepping into uh, the digital space. So you have companies um, like uh, PharmIQ or PharmAx or CropX or I can list a hundred of them who all have some data for you and they will tell you that it's really important. Um, and in a lot of cases it is, uh, but you have to be able to integrate those data sources. That becomes an extremely important part of this. Um, and then, and that becomes a real frustration for farmers if you ask them about that. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in sharing connectedness. The other one is the relative precision of what you can collect compared to the management granularity. So you see the scene in the picture here and you see the little bit of green grass in the foreground and we can probably predict that pretty accurately. You'll note though that it is about um, 10 square meters out of a hundred hectare paddock. And the rest of the landscape is covered with tussocks, which are inedible, it is covered with scrub. There is some grass underneath that and a farmer will make a decision on how many days the animal will spend in that paddock. The interesting thought is that this 100 hectare paddock is part of a 64,000 hectare property, and the farmer needs to make decisions about all 64,000 hectares on a daily basis over about three different enterprises um, and probably 30 mobs of animals and so if we are going to provide him with a precision that's down to per centimeter, um, maybe we are not actually providing him with the right information for the granularity of the management decision that he needs to make. And that's extremely important in terms of getting farmers to trust what this digital technologies can do. And then the last point is sharing and connectedness. And sharing and connectedness is about being able to pass information from one place to another. So in New Zealand, we have a system of um, electronic ID identification in cattle and deer, which is there to manage um, disease risk in, in those uh, livestock classes, specifically tuberculosis. This EID in the animal is the farmer's responsibility but he loads the animals onto a truck and the truck driver then has to take some responsibility for getting those animals and that record to the next point of sale, which might be a sale yards, it might be a processing um, facility. Then they have to take on that responsibility so that they know the fate of the animal um, without connectedness, without some sort of connectivity then this is a very piecemeal and a very holy system. And that is one of the spaces that um, digital technologies can improve the, the lot of the farmers in terms of creating that. As soon as you lose that connectivity across the value chain, then you start again to farmers to doubt your um, validity in the space and it, farmers step back into doing what is familiar and assured. Farmers are happy to take risks. Farmers take a lot of risks a lot of the time, but they do it because they know what the outcome might look like. And stepping into the digital space without some trust means that uh, this is something that they have never seen before. So we think of um, Daniel Kahneman's um, prospect theory and this holds extremely well in this space. If you haven't taken that risk before, it is a very large hurdle to step into um, a new space and away from the old data sources and the old ways that you did things. So just want to think a little bit about the future. And if we think about 
probably the first steps that we're going to see is the fit of the grazing animal into those soil and pasture resources. It's sort of the biophysical space. Um, it's relatively easy to calibrate considering the amount of information that we have. And it will improve the utilization of that landscape. It will potentially change the stocking rates in that landscape. It will definitely change the nutrient distributions in those landscapes and hopefully will um, reduce the amount of nutrient leakage. Then we can start to think about um, start to think about designing new landscape configurations. And that becomes decidedly important when we start to think that we're going to transform things. And in that space, we're looking at things like um, enhancing the natural resources or natural ecosystem services, um, bioprotection. Interestingly enough, with uh, some of our steps, and hopefully it may well tap into what Shannon's going to be talking about in, in uh, the near future. We've been talking with places like our, um, some of our major cities and uh, looking at um, cultural and heritage protections on some of our um, national farms, for example, and also the opportunity to um, separate animals from uh, people using virtual fencing so that we can have more recreational use uh, in those landscapes. Um, new enterprise development, and it's really important to understand that digital technologies don't replace labor. If you ask the guys who are running um, uh, some of our um, robotic dairy systems, for example, they will tell you that instead of having somebody uh, to herd the cows, you actually have somebody to look after all the tech. So that immediately starts to change who lives in the rural landscape. And again, hopefully, um, Shannon will be talking a little bit around the opportunity to put animals into traditional horticulture and broad acre systems, especially if we can control the animals. And this particular graphic you will see has an e-shepherd neck band. And the opportunity there is we have the farmer uh, interacting with the data. We may even have a client specifying um, that they want a product of a specific type. They want a milk of a specific type. Um, the farmer is able to, to steer the cow into the right part of the landscape to produce a product which immediately uh, meets that client's need or that consumer's need. And so you can see that that sort of data sharing, the, the farmer and the, uh, the customer being able to have a direct link through a digital model um, means that you can deliver all sorts of new products, um, and in fact, you may even have that uh, customer being a direct investor into that farming practice. So um, the opportunities with digital technologies and linking all of those uh, parts of the value chain together um, could be quite um, significant. And uh, if that was the case, we will be transforming our landscape using some of our digital technologies. Uh, kia ora tate. Thank you for your um, attention. Okay, David, thanks for that talk. That was really interesting. Uh, we're just going to move into some Q&A for the next sort of 10 minutes or so before Shannon's talk. Uh, so I'd just like to start off the question session. Uh, so if you either just uh, raise your hand if you want to ask a question or um, potentially if you just sort of speak up and, and ask one, that's fine too. Uh, but the question I wanted to ask you was around the uh, data integration. So obviously farmers are becoming uh, much more sort of technology based. So they're starting to have to interpret large amounts of data from, from different data sources, I guess, as well. And so I guess I just wanted to ask like how you thought um, that sort of integration of data will actually happen in, in the near future. So for example, we have things like Minder here in New Zealand, which sort of gives us our fertility and, and breeding sort of data. Um, do you think that that will continue to evolve and, and how do you think that will evolve in the near future? Yeah, it's a good, good question, Anita. I think that the, the interesting thought, especially in the dairy space, um, is that those guys are already 
uh, working towards um, creating platforms that share all that data. Um, so, so there's a, a joint uh, Fonterra LIC um, program already in that space. And that gives some real power for farmers to be able to access the data. It also gives a lot of power for um, the holders of the data to add more value to it. Um, and the again, the interesting thought there is going to be what sort of model is going to be put in place from a business perspective because the farmers actually own that data. And that is going to be, that's always a, a serious challenge. Um, we do have a, a data accord in New Zealand, um, which uh, most of our companies have bought into. Yet one of the significant barriers to that use of data um, is some of the business models that are being put together uh, that are holding data and, and in fact, one of the bugbears of farmers is that they can't get their own raw data back effectively and efficiently. Um, and so, so those models, um, it will be interesting to see how they progress. Um, I would think that from my experience with farmers to date, um, they usually cast that sort of stuff aside quite quickly. If they can't get their own stuff back, they will move on to a new technology, whoever's going to provide that. Um, and so, yeah, the, the whole area of building those systems is really important. And I think that um, some of our friends and some of those companies will be um, left short, methinks, in the near future. That's a um, great answer. Uh, I do have a question here from Ian. So the first one is, uh, the first comment is that um, Dave Swain and the virtual fencing stuff was sort of like getting going in the in the noughties and you know 20 years for a technology to become mature is quite interesting in terms of the time frames over which we have to look in support of farming. The other one is um, when when will uh, the animal rights groups say that cows own their own data, right? Um, uh, <laughs> And New Zealand is uh, ahead of the game in terms of animal rights, in terms of giving similar rights to, to great apes as they do to people. Um, the question is, um, it relates to the fact that uh, as we did use data more, uh, more um, liberally, it removes the practitioner from the field. And that is a... Uh, potentially a significant loss because of the fact that data isn't telling you everything about the system. And so how do we ensure that people still retain their relationship with the field um, and not just get you know, uh, have themselves lost in the office becoming data jockeys? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question, Ian. Um, and where, I, where I see it at the moment, well, certainly my experiences of talking to the farmers, there's, there's two things they don't want to lose in this whole process. One of them is the connectivity with the people, right? So, so actual, true, real person-to-person -person contact. Uh, so, so almost the worst thing you can do for a farmer is just send them an email and expect something to happen. Um, you know, so, so that, that and, and that's part of the culture of, of farming. It's part of what we need to retain inside of that. And then the second part is, um, if you see the, the, the graphic that I have behind me there, the complexity of these systems is so great that I would think we are a very long way from replacing the practitioner. And, and one of the things you brought up, um, the virtual fencing approach, um, one of the things that we find in, in even in things like setting fences and where those fences go, you need really good stockmanship. You need to understand the animal before you just draw a fence on a paddock. And you need to understand how the animal uses that range, where it goes, which boundaries it will cross anyway, regardless of what you try to do to it. And uh, therefore, that understanding needs to be maintained within all of those sort of uh, within the digital. And it's almost like the talk that we had from Robin earlier, um, talking about uh, 
integrating um, our scientific view and some of our more traditional uh, knowledge views. This is another one of those that that those systems need to be merged together. If you lose one, you will the the other one won't work. Great, thanks. Thanks for that, Dave. So I think we have another question from uh, Peter. Yeah. Um, let me see if I. Um can be coherent here um, and I, in some ways it follows on from Ian's question and it's really um, it's related to animal rights um, uh, not in the sense that Ian was mentioning um, but more about uh, I'm sitting here in Europe okay uh, I'm actually in Paris I'm speaking to you uh, from there today and animal rights are a pretty big issue here. My only question is, and I don't have any partisan um, approach here. Do you get um, any pushback um, from, say, uh, NGOs, civil society organizations about seeing uh, cows with all of this uh, fascinating equipment attached to them, is there any public pu pushback on this from um, an animal, animal rights, if you if you wish to use that word, perspective? So yeah, again, really good question, Peter. It's um, it's really really important to uh, work through what those technologies do and what they mean for the animal. So. A lot of the technologies that are, um, we've, we'll call them wearable techs, that's the fancy word you use for, for people. Um, if they work towards uh, understanding the animal's health and its well being, then they are relatively well received, generically. Um, if the kit is poorly designed and actually damages the animal, then they're very poorly received by the farmers first and foremost um, and then the animal rights people after that um, the virtual fencing stuff the virtual herding stuff where where there are various stimulus to make the animal uh, do what you want it to do let's just say or we'll steer the animal in the right direction um, has a range from our from our perspective anyway Certainly the no fence guys doing it in Norway spent, they thought they would just do it. They spent most of their research effort researching animal behavior and welfare in that process uh, to prove to the authorities that um, the animals were still behaving in normal manners and, and weren't being, uh, what would you say, weren't being hurt in the process, that's for sure. Um, and the same has been the case with the Adjacent model in Australia, and all those technologies are actually designed around animal behaviour, and so they are about enhancing animal behaviour. <clears throat> um, will we appease everybody? Probably not. And certainly we've looked in the social media on this, and uh, we get <clears throat> either this is the this is this technology is going to save the world on one end, or the farmer should have the collars strapped to them at the other end. Now, I would say that I have had a collar strapped to me, and it's not that unpleasant. Um, and it's certainly nowhere near as unpleasant as getting an electric fence shock, I tell you that. That's, that's bad. Um, so so this, this, it's understanding the technology. Will we ever get it there? I mean, you know, some, I, I think in general, the general public is, is pretty um, pro the technology at this point in time. Um, so it will, I think it's going to be a technology by technology uh, basis, and we are going to have to do the work. We are going to have to do the work. We can't make any assumptions. Thanks, Peter.